that good? My mom wanted me to let everybody know that although my dad is on a hunting trip this week, he is in church this morning. <laughs> so singing that song, Behold Our God, has got to be one of my favorite songs that we sing. And um, recently, my scripture memorization, I've been memorizing Psalm 34, and there's a verse in there that says, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. Think on that verse this week. I would encourage you to do so. If we were to see God in our state right now, in him and all his glory, us in these bodies, we would be struck dead on the spot. But God's children are going to be able to look at him with his glory reflecting off of us and have absolutely no shame. That is awesome. So turn with me to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. And the title of this morning's message is Things Above. Again, Colossians chapter 3. And as an introduction, I want you to take a moment with me right now to think about your life in relation to these questions. What does your life look like? What do you find yourself continually thinking about during the day and during the night? What takes up the most space in your head? Is it your kids, your spouse, work, or sports even? When you find yourself in a position of stress, where do you find yourself running? And with these questions in mind, I will ask just one more question. What does your life mean to you? Let's open with a word of prayer. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you, we praise you for your great name. We thank you for the only name given under heaven by which men can be saved. And I pray that you would meet with us in this moment, that you would uh, fill me with your spirit, that your mouth will be my mouth and that you would lead us and guide us in all truth. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Again, the question, what does your life mean to you? Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start by reading verses 1 through 8. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. And again, we're going to look at verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So Paul is calling this body of believers to seek the things which are above. He wants them to take their eyes off of the world and to put them on Christ. But he doesn't just tell them to look up at nothing. He directs them to the glorious position of Jesus the risen Savior. Jesus is the righteous right hand of God, and he was glorified by the Father upon his resurrection with the glory that he had before the very foundation of the world. Before the sun, the moon, the stars were created, the physical and the spiritual realm were created, Jesus was full of glory. Do you believe the gospel? I understand that this is a very simple question that most here can answer, but 
I do also fear that even as followers of Jesus, we have, we have lost something. The reason I opened with asking you to think about your life and what fills your mind is because from this, our true walk, our true relationship with God is defined. There are a lot of both professing Christians and true Christians that live their lives in a way that just does not line up with the gospel. If I was to try and breathe underwater, I would die. If I was to get stranded in Antarctica and fall asleep in the deep snow, I would die. These are simple truths, and there's no doubt in any of my mind that everybody here knows that you absolutely would not survive these things, and you would do everything in your power to avoid them at all costs. You believe this truth, you know you will die if you fall asleep in the snow in Antarctica. So these are simple truths, and these are things pertaining to life on earth, but they can't even begin to truly define and describe the things which are above. Does your life reflect what you believe? So what do we believe? We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for the sins of all that would believe in his name and rose on the third day. This is the gospel. But do we truly grasp just how awesome and amazing the gospel is? Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on the likeness of men, and truly became Emmanuel, which is to say, God with us. The great I Am took on flesh, the Son of God took on flesh for the rest of eternity for us. He took on flesh and became a man. He is in a glorified body right now. He will always be God, and now he will always be man. He lived a perfect and righteous life before the Father, thus providing an imputed righteousness for the sins of his children that mere mortal men, you and I, could never, ever, ever obtain. Throughout his earthly ministry, he was mocked, ridiculed, and continuously followed by people that wanted to take his life. But that simply was not going to happen. No one was going to take Jesus' life. When it was Jesus' time, he gave his body to be beaten and torn apart. And I do want you to be thinking about the gospel and what's happening, what happened for us to buy our redemption as I go through this. He allowed a crown of thorns to be driven into the top of his head. He was beaten beyond all recognition and whipped as his flesh was torn off of his bones. No one could recognize who Jesus was at this point. He was beaten that severely. And at one point in this, Jesus, our God, was blindfolded and spit on. And you know what they cried out to him? Prophesy, Lord, who hit you? And he kept going. After all of this, nails were pierced through his hands and through his feet where he was suspended naked on a Roman cross between two criminals. This man was perfect. And all of this open shame and open mockery and physical pain, this was not why Jesus was there. Jesus came to die for the ungodly. He did not come to die for the righteous. 
He came to make the atoning payment for all those that were given to him. Jesus drank every single last drop of the cup of wrath from the Father. My sins that would have made me to burn in the lake of fire for all eternity were placed upon the body of Christ. God's wrath, the Father's wrath towards sin was poured into the body of Christ. But not just for my sins, not just for the sins of everyone in this room that believes in his name, not just for the sins of everyone in Northeast Ohio, for the sins in Ohio, the United States, for the entire world. That many people. The sins, one sin of mine, it would be just for God to judge me for all eternity in the lake of fire. I am unrighteous. I am ungodly. He is holy and just and righteous. One sin. Now think about that. All sins for everyone in the world that has ever lived that believes in the name of Jesus the Christ. And yet as he bore the weight on the cross, the concentrated wrath of the Father, as he bore the weight, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is mind-shattering. That is mind-shattering. I don't think that would be my response to someone if they were to break into my house and torture me in front of my wife and my baby. That's just one instance. This is, that's, this is me. He's God. He's the creator of all things. When the work was complete on the cross. Jesus, with a great shout of victory, cried out, It is finished! In Hebrew, this would have been one word, and it has become my favorite Hebrew word of all time. Quite frankly, it's the only Hebrew word I know. Tetelestai! Jesus Yelled, Tetelestai, one word. And in that word, it means paid in full. It is done. It is complete. Period. This was a shout of victory. All sins for all believers, for all people that would ever believe in his name were cast as far as the east is from the west. Also, my favorite analogy is that the east to the west, Casting Crowns has, has a song and he's asking a question and he says, Lord, will you show me just how far the east is from the west? And he says, from one scarred hand to the other. That distance cannot be found. If I was to walk in circles and walk east and continually walk east and keep going and going and going and I would never, ever, ever stop I'm trying to make it to where I'm going west. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. That's how far your sins have been cast. From one scarred hand to the other. And it's impossible for the sins that have been paid for, that were placed in the body of Christ, to ever be brought up against you before God it's as if you have never sinned one single time. Not only that, but you have the righteousness of Christ. Death has been taken off of you. He rose on the third day, defeating our greatest enemy, death. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Jesus is alive. And all that being said, I will ask and I must ask again, how do you live your life? Do you live your life like Jesus is still on the cross? Do you live your life like Jesus is still in the grave? 
verses 2 and 3 of our text. It says, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When you place your faith in Christ, the old man is crucified with him, and you have received eternal life, which no man can take away. Set your mind on things above, and do not allow the distractions of this temporary world ever become an idol to you. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's marvelous light and have been adopted as the sons and daughters of God. And where is our life? It is hidden with Christ in God. This is a game of hide-and-seek that the devil simply will never win. If God hides something, there isn't a single thing that can find it. This speaks to the security of the believer. If we were given this and it was up to us to keep it, we would lose it in a heartbeat. We could never have the ability to hold on to our eternal life. And we can have peace in knowing that just as we could not make the payment for our sins, we cannot lose the payment that was already made for our sins. Salvation belongs to God. He will not lose it. He will not lose us. He loses not one single sheep. All that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in Romans 8, 35-39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he's asking a question. Will any of these things separate me from God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will ever be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where are we hidden? We are hidden in Christ. We are hidden in one who will not lose us. And understanding your eternal security in Jesus is one of the most key elements to the Christian walk. Because I know that whenever I am fully resting and fixed on the gospel, I'm a lot more likely to share the gospel with a stranger. I'm a lot more likely to be compassionate to someone that is hurting. And when I am fully fixed on the righteousness of Christ and the wonderful fact that his righteousness has been imputed to me, I am much, much, much more full of boldness. Another one of my favorite verses out of quite a few, but they're all my favorite, is Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace. I live my life out in a completely different way when I'm going through the day fixing my mind on Jesus. When you realize that your God is much bigger than all of creation, and that is the God who keeps you, it actually begins to be more difficult to live in fear tables kind of start to turn the other way. There are billions of light years worth of stars surrounding us. And scientists have yet to fully reach the end. We can't can't find it. Our God is holding all that together. And not only is he holding all that together, he has named every single one of them. There isn't a single star created that does not have a name he has named them all and just as he has named them all he numbers and he knows the hairs that are on our head there isn't a single hair that falls from my head onto the ground as i walk that he does not know about
the sun, the moon, the stars, the birds, the bees, the trees, every molecule of dirt, he holds it all together. Is this difficult for him to do? No! He's God! He holds it all together in the palm of his hands. It is an effortless task for him to do this. So not only does fixing your mind on Christ and his perfect love cast out fear, but it also begins to purge sin out of our life. When we understand that this is the God that died for us, that raised because of our justification, God was satisfied with what he did on the cross. He is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. When we realize that that God that's holding all that together, that keeps us, that goes before us, that will always be with us, that will never leave us nor forsake us, that is the God that we serve, that has saved us, that has redeemed us, that calls us his own, sin just starts to get pushed away. So I'll read verses 4 to 11 of our text. <clears throat> when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, and there's a reason, therefore is therefore. So in light of what was just stated, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse number four should be a great motivator for us as believers to put off the deeds of the flesh. When Christ, our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. This should start making us think a lot more about how we live our lives in light of the gospel. We will appear with him in glory. He has made us to be joint heirs of the kingdom, of the kingdom with him. We will appear with him when he returns to earth to destroy all of his enemies. We will reign with him for a thousand years, and we will do this with glorified, imperishable, immortal, never sinning bodies, complete and utter perfection with God for all eternity. Amen. Bodies that will never again feel pain or sadness, they will never have to fight against sin because we will have bodies that are fashioned and created and made in the likeness of Jesus. Bodies like Jesus has right now. That blows my mind. I get tired of being sick. I get tired of struggling against sin, against fighting against sin. I get tired of fighting against selfishness and fighting against pride. I, I hate it. I don't, I don't like it. I want it gone. Something that has been extremely encouraging to me, though, in, in this battle against the flesh is... Our life is but a vapor that comes for a moment and then passes away. I'm going to blink and then I'm going to be with God for all eternity. This life right here on this earth, even though things get a little rocky sometimes and they're getting even more rocky as time goes on, it's nothing compared to our eternal life that we have in Jesus. Should it not be our reasonable service to put off the deeds of the flesh for Jesus that has done everything for us? Out of love for him, we should desire to be more and more like him. 
We are to put off the old man, for that man, the old man, was crucified with Christ. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, anger, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, a lying tongue, get them out of here. When Jesus spoke with the disciples, he said that it is better that I go away because when I go away, I will send the helper, our comforter. He will send the Holy Spirit. These things that I previously mentioned are constantly fighting against us, but we forget that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We forget that the Holy Spirit lives inside us and is our power against the flesh. Will we ever be perfect while we are in these bodies? No. But through time, does that battle begin to change? Does that battle begin to look a little bit different? He's our constant help to us in pushing the sins listed previously out of our lives. Call on his name and do not ever try to do it on your own. Because the second we try and start fighting against the flesh on our own, what happens? We fail. Our pride starts to seep up, but pride comes before a fall. We have to humble ourselves before God. We have to submit ourselves to him. And then we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. Verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So what happens whenever these deeds of the flesh are put off? We are not left empty, but are filled with great spiritual blessings. Blessings of the fruit of the Spirit, we begin to become individuals that are tender and merciful. Kindness begins to spill out of our hearts onto all those around us because our God anoints our head with oil and our cup runs over. We cannot help but let the love, the joy of Jesus spill out of ourselves onto all those around us. We want people to be able to look at us, especially now with the chaos of the world, and look at us and say, what is the reason for the blessed hope that is in you? Why are you happy? Why are you joyful? The world is falling apart. No, my God is bringing it back together because his word never fails. He's told us what's going to happen. I take full peace in knowing that. I take full peace in knowing that my God is in complete control. If he allows something to happen, ultimately for some reason that we cannot see because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways, he will be glorified. All glory will go back to him at the end of the road. We cannot see that right now. But what we can see is Jesus we can see that Jesus is the risen Savior and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. His work for our redemption, it's done. It's complete. So as we're filled and changed, 
by God, by the Spirit that lives inside of us, we become more humble and understand that without God, we truly can do absolutely nothing. We are meek and do not respond out of anger towards those who wrong us. And we are patient with all those in our life and do not allow words of impatient spite to come out of our mouth. And even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Here's the toughie. But this is also why everything needs to be done in light of the gospel. How many sins have you committed against God today? Don't answer. Think. How many sins have you committed against God this week in the past seven days? How many sins have you committed against God since January? How many sins have you committed against God in your entire life? That's a big number, and I don't think we can count that high. Just as Christ has forgiven us, so also must you do. Well, I don't, well, he just did the, it doesn't matter. Well, she just won't, it does not matter. Our excuses for not forgiving people, especially forgiving our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, are ridiculous. We have no excuse. We are commanded, just as Christ has forgiven us, likewise must you do. We don't keep track of other people's wrongs against us. When we realize that we are in Christ and that our sins are completely forgiven and paid for and cast as far as the east is from the west or west is from the east, your response towards others in your life is completely different. So also must you forgive them without limit, never ending, never keeping track. And verse 14, but above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourself. Do we live our lives like this? Paul said, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain? What? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Jesus became a servant to men, and the servant is not greater than the master. Right before he died, Jesus, the eternal God, was stooped down, washing the feet of the disciples. God did that. That is the example that we follow. That is the Jesus that we follow. We are to be servants to all men. Jesus showed us a completely perfect example of what true love looks like. And we are called to take up our cross and follow him. We are called to deny ourselves and live our lives for the sake of others. Do you want the love of, do you want to love others like Jesus loves you? Put them first. Look out for others' needs rather than your needs first. If someone cuts you off in traffic, pray that someone steps into their life and shares the gospel. That's a really hard one for me because I drive 271 and 480 to work and I I do need the grace of God in that area of my life. (laughs) Respond, but respond differently in those situations. You will be less frustrated with other people as time goes on. If someone lies about you to others and your reputation becomes great, count it all joy because you have been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And for this, great is your reward in heaven. A reward, whatever it looks like, I don't know. Someday. 
But that's an, a reward that will never pass away. And if a glass of water is given to someone in the name of Jesus, that man has not lost his reward. That's a, that's a very small act of kindness. That's a, the type of act of kindness that we can do pretty much everywhere we go. We have every reason in the world to give thanks to God, and we are to do this in every single season. In seasons of doubt, in seasons of depression, in seasons of pain, in seasons of mourning, we can have joy. We can have joy because we know what happens next. No pain in this life for the believer is ever without purpose because all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And my beloved brethren, do not let the flesh reign in your life. The flesh is always going to try and distract you away from the Great Commission, and it is always going to try and get you to forget the things that are above. So to close, I would like to finish with reading some promises of God to all believers that will never cease to be true. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Jesus died so that we could have eternal life. God will keep you. He will always be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God will give you the strength and the power to serve him. God will lead us in all truth. Jesus gives us life and gives it more abundantly. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Jesus is our constant hope and our blessed assurance. We are filled with peace because we know the Prince of Peace. He gives wisdom liberally to all children that ask of him in faith. He comforts us in our grieving. He has gone to prepare a place for us to live with him. So I could go on with that for a very long time, but I would like to finish with this one. Jesus is coming again. And he is coming again very soon. We're closer now than when we first believed. It's like, it's like right around the corner, guys. How do we want to be living our lives whenever Jesus comes back? Because I cannot think of a better way to be living our lives as the children of God than for Jesus to come back and God's children to be dwelling together in unity, for his children to be singing to each other, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, for his children to be compassionate to everyone that steps into their life, for his children to continually be forgiving one another because we are without excuse on the whole unforgiveness aspect. Without excuse. When Jesus comes back, that's what I want all of us in this room that is children to be doing, loving one another and dwelling together in unity and being compassionate to every single person that is in our life. Because as we are the light of the world, other people don't have light. Other people have darkness. They dwell in darkness. They have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Where are they going to get that? Where are they going to learn about Jesus? They're going to see it from you guys. They're going to see it from me and how we respond to other people, how we respond to things where other people may respond in anger and wrath and hate. We respond in patience and love, and we endure with them in love. As time goes on, taking up your cross, because a cross is, is a symbol of pain. And Jesus hung on a Roman cross, and he died for us on a cross. But as we're more filled with the Spirit, as we're seeking after him, as we're setting our mind on things above, 
taking up our cross to follow Jesus, it gets easier. Taking up our cross becomes less and less and less of a burden. And we actually have joy in carrying our cross. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, because he knew that he was going to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. He knew that when the work was complete, all of his sheep will have been redeemed for all eternity. I want Jesus, when he comes back, to look at us and to take pleasure in how we are living for him. And I will shut up after this because I don't have anything else written down. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if there are any of you today that have not yet placed your faith in his name, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what sins you've committed, it doesn't matter how dark of a thought has, has gone into your mind that may even dwell in your mind, it does not matter what you have done because the blood of Jesus washes away the sins of all that trust in his name. Believe that he died, was buried, and rose on the third day. This is the gospel message that believers live in, and this is the gospel message that the unrighteous, the ungodly are saved by. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, you need the gospel every single day. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. I thank you that you have given your son to die for us and to take our sins upon himself. And I pray that we would live our lives in light of the gospel, that, that we would daily walk in the gospel, and that other people would be able to look at us and want what we have, that they would want to have the blessed hope that is in us and that we will be ready to give them a reason for it. I pray that we would rejoice, for this is the day that you have made, and I pray that we would continually, as a church, be unified, that we would love one another, that we would love other people, and that our hearts and our minds will be fully fixed on you, and that we would be full of peace, full of faith, full of hope, and full of love, but Lord, most of all, love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.